So welcome to those uh, those handful of you that have joined us um, and hopefully we'll get lots more people coming in over the next few minutes. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, webinar in our series on emergency food planning, which is the second webinar series in our Food Cities 2022 initiative. I'm Florence Pardo from the Food Foundation. Um, and uh, for those of you who are um, either with us in the room or are watching this back and don't know um, about who we are and what we do, the Food Foundation are a charity based in uh, the UK. We work on uh, food system change um, uh, across both nationally and internationally, um, uh, primarily working to influence food policy um, and business practice towards healthy and sustainable food systems. Um, and one area of focus is cities for us. Um, a few years ago, we uh, had a we developed a learning partnership between Birmingham in the UK and Pune in India, uh, which was called the Bindi Partnership. And of the success of this learning partnership, we have begun the uh, Food Cities 2022 initiative, which expands that partnership um, with a particular focus on um, cities uh, within the Commonwealth due to our association with the Birmingham Commonwealth Association and the culmination of this partnership um, taking place at a meeting mm -hmm. Um, at the, uh, the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham next year. Um, and through the partnership, cities that are engaged um, will be, uh, as, as direct members of the partnership, will be receiving um, access to peer-to-peer -peer learning, one-on-one -on -one support. Um, mm -hmm. And we're also running three webinar series, um, which uh, this is the second of, as I mentioned. And we've launched a learning platform um, which I'll be sharing links um, to in the chat in just a second. And the learning platform we've developed is um, we've we've put it together in such a way that we're hoping it's a really accessible directory of information for anyone working on food system transformation within cities. Um, and on that platform, you'll find all the materials um, from this webinar series, including those from today. You'll find more about the future webinars um, and you'll be able to register um, for those webinars there. For anyone who registered for this webinar within the last uh, about 24 hours, you wouldn't have received the email that contains some of those um, resources for today's webinar. And you will be able to find those on the platforms. We've got um, some relevant reports and some case studies um, that go uh, along with today's content. So I will pop that in the chat in just a second. Um, so that's a little bit about the, the partnership um, and about the webinar series. Um, just a bit of um, quick housekeeping. If I could remind everyone to keep themselves on mute and also to let you know that we are recording the session. So please keep your cameras off if you don't wish to be recorded. And of course, being a learning partnership, we really encourage dialogue. So please do use the chat function um, and I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the webinar. So um, I'm now going to um, introduce um, Kim. So Kim is the founder of the Feeding Cities Group, which is a social enterprise dedicated to creating more resilient urban food systems. She has a doctorate in applied economics and has spent her career on food system issues. And she's our lead consultant in designing and managing this webinar series. So mm -hmm. pleasure to hand over to you, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Florence. We appreciate it. So I want to thank Florence and Shaleen Malou, who's here as well. And they've been our fearless leaders for this webinar series, and we couldn't have done it without them. So uh, thank them all for their logistical support, as well as their amazing thought leadership, as they're both um, tremendous experts in their own right. Um, so the motivation for this emergency food webinar series was, you know, and, and we've been working on this issue for about the past decade, but the pandemic really highlighted the, the fact that cities were not prepared uh, for any type of crisis like this. And, and so um, as we were preparing a concept note and talking to C40 and others, including Barbara Emanuel, who many of you know, she's in Toronto and here as well, um, started to think about what cities need in terms of strategies and wound up in this great partnership with the Food Foundation. And as we thought about emergency food, um, you know, for us, it's not, you know, we didn't want to take just a tactical bend to it, but wanted to think about how to frame it out and, and thought about the different drivers that lead to emergency food crises. And 
understanding these different drivers is so important because that leads to obviously the right solutions. So that's how we've structured this webinar series. There are four in the series all around different uh, crises that create different emergency food situations. And then the fifth webinar series is meant to wrap it all up and leave people really with templates and tools uh, to bring it home to their own cities. So for each webinar, we have an expert and policymaker that will frame the conversation. And then we have two city level practitioners from different cities. That's our format for every webinar. And today's speakers, Kelsey, if you could go ahead and share the, the slide. And with that, introducing our my colleague, Kelsey Nordine uh, at, the fitting, at the Feeding Cities Group, um, who many of you have been in touch with already and handles all of our logistics and, and helps develop all the materials for this. Great. So, so if you wanna to switch to the next one, Kelsey. So for this webinar, we have three speakers, Sylvie Wobbs from FAO, or FAO, and Bobby Zachariah from Pune, and Andrea Margarini from Milan. So I wanna welcome all of them, and they'll be speaking in that order. We have a few questions here that were sent out to all the participants as well by email, but just food for thought. So we want you to be thinking about what this looked like in your own city? Is it still happening? Are you still feeling the effects? And what were the greatest challenges in meeting emergency food? What did your city do well? So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker so we can get going again as other participants slowly, slowly enter the, the Zoom here. So we're honored to have Sylvie Wobbs Kandati kick off this webinar. She's an agronomist and resilience advisor for the Resilience Strategic Program in the Emergency and Resilience Office of the FAO at the United Nations. And she has extensive knowledge of how disasters, cities, and conflicts are driving world hunger. So she's going to draw on this great experience to provide a broad perspective from which to think about emergency food. So Sylvia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. Thank you, uh, uh, Florence, Kisley, everyone. Best greeting from Rome, rainy today. And it's an honor and pleasure to kickstart our, our conversation with some of the sort of global, global thinking, global framing on um, multiple risk management that straddle across rural and urban areas and linking to the various processes which are ongoing, which are all very relevant with the topic about um, food in cities and emergency planning, emergency response, but also overall risk management, to be more on the preventative and anticipative side of things. I'm going to share my screen. I have going to take you through um, the few slides which I have, which are a bit dense uh, a time, so bear with me, but you can have all the participants, you can have that as a, as a reference for future um, exploration of other tools and topics and so on, because resilience today is on the everybody's agenda, and in FAO and for many other partners we work with also, emergency uh, preparedness and emergency uh, response are part of the resilience building process. So we're trying not to separate the emergency work from the development, climate and investment work, but to bring all this together. Um, I'm trying to go to the next slide, but I think here I need your help because I cannot move to the next slide as we've discovered before. Okay, if in that case, um, I will share your slides for you and um, I mean, you can tell me to move on to the next slide. So if so, you'd like to stop sharing and I'll bring your slides up. Yes, sorry about this. No problem. The mystery of a uh, mystery of, Zoom indeed. Of, of virtual world. Absolutely. All right, bear with me one minute. Hopefully you yes. can see my screen there. Yes, very well. Great. And if you just like to tell me when you want me to move on, yes. I shall be safe. Voila, here we are. The second slide. 
I want to take you, and this is very apt to um, what's ongoing today. We are having the big uh, climate uh, conference ongoing in Glasgow, and we're talking in, in our language in FAO and some of the other languages. In, I'm speaking here a lot for the, the UN perspective. Um, we're talking about major global crises but also some of the local or national or regional crises that are ongoing. Most of these are cascading and colliding together and affecting not only, as I said, a rural area, but also urban areas in terms of food systems, but all the other systems that are involved, systems or sectors. Of course, we are in an ongoing climate change crisis, climate crisis, climate emergency. This is very much the priority number one. The second one, which we name differently, can be called the nature crisis, biodiversity crisis, environmental crisis. Also, although very often environment and climate are lumped together, which is not very helpful because they need separate, different type of action, working together, but different type of action. Another one is the very big pollution crisis. If you look at the air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution, ocean pollution, it's affecting everyone everywhere. And the, the other one, which is the first priority I should have started for, with that, we are in the COVID-19 ongoing unfolding emergency, touching again everywhere, everyone, affecting most systems, include the, including the food system. And it's been a big hurdle at the beginning, especially in cities, because of the restriction measures. But then very quickly, it was considered that food was a priority sector and the barriers were more or less uh, um, relaxed for the food system actors. So this colliding situation means that we are recommending for a multi-risk and multi-crisis uh, management approach not focusing at one risk at a time, but um, you know, framing and, and piggybacking on what tools and, and what um, measures exist for managing these risks in one area or the other. Next. And can you put the next? Okay, so this is leading partly to um, a number of countries in acute food insecurity. We're calling these the food, food crisis situation in, in, our, in our work in FAO, but also with, with many partners. And these are driven by a um, um, standard approach of assessing food insecurity and malnutrition, the, the, the IPC integrated phase classification approach. And, and looking at the, the so we're having, this is an increase, 55 countries and territories, more than, than 20 million more people um, from 2019, reaching to 155 million. It's, it's already, I mean, much too much. Each person is too much. It's not acceptable to have this situation today. Major drivers that have been clustered together are linked to conflict insecurity. Um, and insecurity, so uh, socioeconomic shocks and, and the climate extreme events, mainly extreme events, but also slow onset events, climate variability. Next. The, the COVID-19 today has been, if you like, it's like a tip of the iceberg of the, the, the crisis situation and this colliding of crisis and cascading that we are, we are having. Um, it's not perceived in the same way everywhere, but we know that the smallholders, those one producing food or um, processing food or consuming food in those most vulnerable and fragile countries are really on the front line and are experiencing extremely different livelihoods, extremely different um, difficult situation. Um, and they're very much affected. And the COVID pandemic has been an aggravator of the situation. Uh, this is impacting all sectors, especially the agri-food sectors, indirectly the agri-food sectors. But again, it's been um, a problem in cities and the cities and the, the territories surrounding the cities. 
it has been showing this COVID-19 is revealing a number of, of aspects is that we have to deal with systemic risks. Systemic risk, that means it's touched the whole system and it's not only one thing at a time or one place and one location. It really has to become, managing these risks has to become much more in the fabric of all the decision-making that we take and investments, policies, practices. And we know that we're living in a world where this is not the case today. Next. We, we have discussed the climate crisis and, and these are a few slides that are advocating in particular, like COVID, the climate is even much bigger as a systemic uh, crisis, systemic risk management, because agriculture and food production, we know is weather dependent. And so it's, it's a sector, the agri-food system is both part of, of the problem of the crisis we are in the climate change, but it's also a solution. And advocating for the transformation where the cities have a very big role in championing new action and championing advanced innovative approaches is extremely important for solving the, the climate crisis. Agri-food system is probably the third most important sector after energy and transport. Uh, even in terms of uh, sequestration, you see this figure here, uh, it can bring certainly more than 20% of uh, greenhouse gas sequestration. And this is why it's very important that we all work together um, to, to contribute to the transformation. Next. We, we are working on the building of the resilience of the agri-food system as an essential part of the transformation. And in terms of this sort of framing uh, opportunity that you're giving me today here, in FAO and in line with the sort of UN common guidance on resilience, which advocate for a system approach, we're having a bit of a taxonomy and naming of, of, of uh, key issues, which is important because otherwise we do not understand one another when we work on resilience. And we are talking on risk, about risk, about events, about shocks and stresses. So events are in two categories, the shocks and the stresses. I think the emergency planning that we are discussing this webinar is more about shocks. But we should not forget about these stresses because these stresses aggravate and um, accumulate, aggravate the, the, the impact of these shocks on the, on the food system, wherever you are um, uh, in the local, um, local rural or urban areas. And what we call stressors are sort of risk drivers that are process or condition that come on top of these. And we are focusing here with this emergency uh, planning in cities, we're really looking at these type of shocks that creates sort of humanitarian conditions so people don't have enough food um, in, in a certain time and scale. And it's important to separate and differentiate these things because that's driving the way we are respond, the way we are managing these multiple, multiple risks. And that we understand that these risks are a function of exposure, vulnerability, and the, the hazard or the, the, the event that is happening. Next. We, I will go this, through this quite quickly because, we, because of time. We, we have managed in the, for the agri-food system, we find that in FAO and together with our partners, that it's important to unpack a bit, to have a bit of a taxonomy of what are these shocks and stresses that threaten and affect the agri-food system across territories. And this is again very important. So when we're working together, that we can relate to these and we can um, connect these events, these, these hazards, these shocks, and, and handle these two together. So we've been classifying based on the UNDRR work, we've been classifying this type of events. And you can have this in these slides as a reference in terms of geological events, climate related events, ecosystem related events, really nature based um, uh, events. 
biological events, this is what we have with the COVID, the technological events, the economic events, political governance, one very much linked to the conflict, and what we call the protracted crisis situation, which is the fragility situation, which is usually a combination of all these events all together. Next. Here, it's important to look at what, what are we qualifying these stresses. And usually in the jargon, in climate change, we're talking about climate change being a stressor, you know, an accelerator of the drivers of other risks. In fact, this is a bit misleading because very often we, what we recommend is that we unpack climate change into shock and stresses with the extreme events, the droughts, storms and flood, and then the slow onset events, which are seawater uh, rise, uh, so gradual change in temperature and so on. It's important to try to distinguish these, these because again, as I said, for the risk management perspective. So we separated these stresses with this list of, you know, poverty, gender inequality, urbanization. Those are gradual changes that are making um, a shock, uh, aggravating shock. Uh, impacting or disasters impacting people, but they are not what we are managing per se for resilience building. Next. So what I would like to bring um, uh, to you, and I think the organizers are sharing this, this uh, reference as material, is that we have contributed um, as if it was part of the UN as an interagency common guidance on, on resilience that gives us a fairly simple definition of resilience building, calling on five main priorities, uh, the capacity. The capacity to prevent, to anticipate, to absorb, to adapt and transform. This is very important because it is not a question of just absorbing or responding to an emergency. It's very important that responding to the emergency and planning for emergency is a very critical step, but it's not sufficient. Partly because we're quickly going to be overwhelmed with the number of crises that are cascading on top of one another. And, and so the only way to reduce this impact is to be more preventative and more anticipative and to manage risk before they turn into disasters. Sylvie, thank you. We're we're about out of time. Could we just do maybe one wrap up slide, and then unfortunately we need to move on. Okay. Um, we go to your last slide. Yes, the we are having a number of initiatives, um, and this is one. And there's the link on the city region food system, which is really putting the linkages between the role of cities and their territories. And that's a very important one, which is trying to bring in this multi-risk management perspective. Um, right. Maybe what the slide out I would really like to finish on. So we have also this uh, FAO Green Cities Initiative, just to tell you how the role of cities, how important it is for, um, for transforming the, the, the food system and the role of, right. of uh, different size of cities. And the key slide is this one, and I'd like just to quickly end with what we are offering is in the, for resilience building and the role that cities have in building resilience of the food system um, in cities and surrounding the cities and the whole city region territory is to blend this suite of existing risk management tools. And many of you, you know, or you can relate more easily with one type of tool or the other. And you can see in red, those are really the humanitarian tools, the early warning system, the actionable alert, mm -hmm. with emergency preparedness and response. But it's very important to manage risk in a preventative manner. And this is where you have nature-based solution, the work on food loss and waste, the, the resilience, the um, sustainable diet, the infrastructure risk proofing, very important in an urban context, really? the overall governance and decision making. And I'll stop this as a takeaway on yeah. this constellation of action that are needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And 
we really appreciate that. We have time for maybe one question, but we'll also hopefully have some time at the end as well if there aren't any pressing questions right now. Excellent, then we will tee up Bobby Zachariah. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bobby and Bobby, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. And he now serves as a team lead at the Global Opportunity Youth Network hosted in Pune. Uh, it's the Lighthouse Communities Foundation, but he also has extensive global community development experience um, in with international agencies and disaster affected communities. So he's gonna draw on that as well. Bobby, you can go ahead. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Good morning, good evening, whichever part of the world you are in. And uh, I want to quickly warn you also, we have Diwali here in India. So you may hear crackers in the background. So don't be startled if it happens during the time when I am speaking. So uh, I, I would like to uh, share some of the experiences that we had during the COVID, uh, mainly from the, the first round, but also from the second uh, wave of COVID infections that we had. Um, we, uh, the Pune City Connect, we are recently known as Lighthouse Communities Foundation. Um, so we are a livelihood-based organization working with uh, 15 to 30-year-old young people who are not in education, employment, and training. And uh, so we are connected to a large number of young people from the urban slum communities, from the poorer neighborhoods of Pune. And uh, that's, that's the reason why we engage with young people. And in that context, when the... Uh, when the lockdown happened during the uh, time which starts from the 25th of March onwards till the month of June, um, the whole city was under lockdown and uh, our young people went through a lot of challenges during this time and their families that they belong to. And uh, we as an organization, how we engaged with those young people, their families, and how we adapted to the food crisis that emerged during that time is the crux of the sharing that I would like to do. And at the very end, I also want to share some of the uh, lessons that we learned during this time, which probably can be transferred to other cities around the world. So just to come to the point, um, on the 25th of March, we had the lockdown that was declared in the city of Pune last year in 2020. And uh, so there was a lar large scale confusion among the young people, uh, among the city, uh, among the city dwelling population, what this lockdown is about, what this illness is about. So um, whilst this was happening, uh, there, the entry, uh, the, the movement of the people across the city was severely restricted. Nobody was allowed to go out of their households. And uh, so the young people in the community <laughs> So the people were very scared. And during that time, uh, our team members, we made phone calls to uh, young people in the communities to understand what they were going through. And what emerged through that phone calls is that there was a lot of confusion in the mind of young people. They were very worried about their loss of livelihoods. Nobody was able to work. Nobody was earning any income. And uh, so they were really asking for information, for, uh, for, actual, uh, for uh, uh, accurate information, uh, about COVID. There were lots of uh, fake messages going around in WhatsApp groups. Nobody was able to understand what is the right information and uh, uh, accordingly make a response. So in uh, partnership with Pune Municipal Corporation, which is the government, uh, we had a very good relationship with uh, uh, the government and uh, uh, we talked to them and we informed them that there is a lot of confusion. Can we establish a helpline so that we can provide information. And so that's how we started the information and what emerged through the helpline was that majority of the people were beginning to get really worried about the food supply because uh, whatever little food that they had accumulated in the home, they were running out of it. They did not have any money. The shops were closed. Nobody was able to get out of their home to buy any grocery support. So they were very worried about food. But then many people also said, uh, wanted information about the medical support. Where could they go to get uh, hospitalization in case they get COVID? So these were the kind of information that they were asking about. And then we realized that we, even though we set up the helpline as a information support, now people were asking for food. So in that context, we uh, started reaching out to many collaborative organizations who we were partnering with, with the government, 
uh, with uh, the donor community who we were connected with, uh, the NGO community who we were connected with, and the Aspen Institute who is the uh, in uh, Aspen Institute who is sponsoring the Global Opportunity Youth Network program. And we reached out to all of them and said that there is a huge need for food supply in the city of Pune. So they all said that we are very willing. Uh, please go ahead and start what is required. So with that sense of trust building that we had done with the organizations, we reached out to the community youth who had lost all their livelihood. And we said that we are starting this helpline. We would like to train you. Would you like to be on the helpline? And the young people said, we would rather be on the helpline. We would be rather do something rather than sit at home and wait for things to happen to us. And uh, we were connected to large number of volunteers who reached out to us said that we would also want to do something. We don't want to sit at home and to be um, uh, and to feel fearful. We would really be on the forefront trying to do something about this uh, uh, epidemic that is coming in. And uh, so based on all of this thing, the, the funds that we raised, we started purchasing food and uh, uh, we started also um, uh, prioritizing the families because the number of people who were calling us for food supply was really large in number. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we received uh, approximately 7,000 people calling us on the helpline and we had to really prioritize who were the people who really genuinely needed food because we also realized over a period of time that a lot of people were uh, accumulating food in their home because they were receiving food from multiple sources and we had to prioritize food. In that situation, we reached out to the families and we told them that we do have grocery kits available with us, but would you like to rather allow another family who does not have any food available in their home, would you rather share it with them? So many families started telling us that, uh, of course, we would be happy to prioritize other families. We know that we will also need uh, food in another two weeks time. But if there are other families needing uh, food support, we would rather allow others to get it. And the volunteers in the city of Pune uh, the young community, young people, the donor community, we kept all of them informed. We had weekly debriefings about what is emerging. We kept everybody informed. And over a period of time, we were able to uh, distribute food to approximately 7,000 families. And in this context, I just want to share some numbers uh, with you, uh, how we were systematically documenting. We started working with Google Forms all the phone calls that we were receiving on the helpline, we systematically documented it. We worked with Google Sheets and these Google Sheets were shared with the volunteers who, with whom we were working with. They also started, uh, we had shared data and uh, as they were prioritizing the families, as they were supplying the food to the various neighborhoods across the city, they updated the Google Sheets and we were able to track uh, on a real time basis how food was being supplied, how the phone calls were coming in and how neighborhoods were getting food. And we partnered with a variety of organizations. There were organizations like Robin Hood Army uh, who, were, who had very good experience, expertise in distributing food supply across the city. We did not have that expertise, so we partnered with them. Uh, the government had very deep reach across the city. They had helped us in uh, designing the program and to reach out to communities. There were organizations who were very good in, who came out with innovative approaches to uh, provide money to those neighborhoods where our delivery trucks were not able to reach. So they, we, we reached out with innovative approaches to reach. And in the end, we reached out to 7,000 families. Now, um, I would like to uh, share some pictures. This is how different neighborhoods were reaching out and different neighborhoods of the communities, uh, the volunteers were reaching out and some lessons that we learned during this time. One important lesson was that in this time of fear, it, was, it became very important for us that we listen to people. We listen to partners, to the government, to the young people, to the neighborhood, to the volunteers. And based on the, the feedback that we were receiving from people, we adapted our response and we kept innovating because people had lots of ideas based on real-time community experience, how we should adapt and make our program well. So that's one uh, uh, concept that I would like to share from our experience that listen to people, uh, create uh, innovative approaches and adapt our program based on the feedback that we are receiving. The second thing I also, uh, based on this listening, we also learned that uh, there is short-term approaches that are required, but there are also long-term approaches that are required. For example, providing food is short-term, but over a period of time, 
the the young people and the community started telling us that can you provide us livelihood we really don't want to be dependent on free food we we would rather earn money and and buy our own food so the combination of short term and long term approaches is something that was emerging as a response um and the collective action which i spoke uh, a few times about how do we bring various ngos the the, the volunteers the donors the corporate social responsibility groups the employees of the organization young people from colleges who wanted to intern in this uh, food response and wanted to really make a contribution so um, involving all of those people providing them that opportunity to contribute became a very big learning for us because um, we needed many hands to make this program work because we were working almost like 16 hours a day to make this program work and the more the number of hands that were available it made it very easy and uh, constantly sharing the data experiences with people listening to them building trust with partners that became a very important learning for us and the third lesson what we learned during this time was about um, uh, databases online methods to work during this time because everybody was locked Uh, up in their home nobody there were very few people who were allowed to travel from one part of the city to the other and we had to take very special uh, permits uh, from the government of pune uh, with that special permit the food trucks could move to most of the areas of the of pune these uh, young people who were working as volunteers they could move uh, and again they were stopped by the police uh, at different points and uh, the police was constantly asking them during this lockdown what is it that why are you moving around in the city you should be sitting at home so they had to explain to the police that we are going to operate the helpline so um, online methods became very important we used whatsapp groups for sharing information uh, the the suicide helpline uh, in the city of pune they came on board to train the helpline to operate a helpline uh, how do you sit and listen to the volunteers who were listen to people who were in deep distress how do you do that they also provided emotional support to the volunteers because from morning till evening each of these volunteers were listening to on an average approximately 150 people so they were getting distressed due to the ongoing stress they were hearing so the suicide helpline volunteers helped them to debrief to get the emotional distress out um, and uh, we used uh, uh, google pay in many neighborhoods our our trucks were not able to go because of the restrictions and the uh, blocks road blocks that have been put up in such areas we used google pay and we directly paid to the uh, to the grocer the shop owner and the shop owner provided food to those families who were in that neighborhood so working online is one of the biggest learning that we had and in the very end this is my last lesson i want to share that uh, okay. after this lockdown was over uh, at the end of the last year uh, this year uh, we were we uh, the second wave happened and again a lockdown happened and fortunately uh, what happened is that uh, we had learned a lot of lessons the ngos had learned a lot of lessons uh, and the young people had learned a lot of lessons and uh, due to that the food shortage was not a big problem food was available government had also learned that if you completely lock up people it's going to be a disaster so government allowed certain times in which different neighborhoods could go and buy the food but the biggest learning for us Uh, we were also reaching out to young people through phone calls and the biggest learning that came about for us was that a uh, um, lot of vulnerable people migrants was an important uh, group of people who were very vulnerable because they didn't they did not belong to the city so they when they ran out of money they were not able to pay rent uh, so that's a vulnerable group and uh, young people who did not have high school education they were one of the first ones to lose their job and uh, and run out of money so that's a vulnerable group and uh, a lot of young people said that we now realize that we have not been saving money whatever we get we just spend it so that's a big vulnerability and again um, 30% of the families they were living on very very low income they were able to somehow live when everything was okay but when during the lockdown they found out that this money runs out very quickly we didn't they didn't have any savings and they started borrowing money from the neighbors but the neighbors also started running out of money widows and divorced yes. young women were at risk as well so thank you uh, bobby can i just yes. say one more sentence so okay one more sentence program, our program then said that like you know let's help build livelihoods for these young people by giving them jobs uh, vocational training and entrepreneurship so these okay. are our e learn see Thank you so much. I know it's so hard to uh to shorten 
you know, condense everything that you did in, in such a short presentation. No so problem. I'm done. That. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to start to move to our next speaker, Andrea Magarini, who we're so happy. But um, Andrea, if you want to start sharing your screen, if there are any pressing questions for Bobby, otherwise we can hold them to the end. Any hands up? Anyone? You can also chat anytime. Excellent. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker. Last but not least, as we say, Andrea, who's the chair of EuroCities Working Group Food and the coordinator of the Milan Food Policy inside the mayor's office, where he facilitates the engagement of organizations for actions on food innovation. And we just really welcome his presentation on all of the incredible work done on food resilience and emergency food in Milan. So I'll hand it off to you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for my invitation. It's very a pleasure to, to share uh, such important topic that um, all of our cities are try to facing uh, after uh, after and during the pandemic. And let me say also hello to some of my friends that are here already connected. Uh, so I want to show uh, to show my present to divide my presentation in three main steps. The first is how COVID affect um, our food system and what. Uh, we organize ourselves to have a quick response. Then uh, the second part is regarding our response. And uh, thirdly, and the last part uh, is about some uh, suggestions uh, based on the lessons that we learned in uh, the, last, uh, the last year and also in this period in the post pandemic. Uh, so I start with uh, to, to come back in our memory to the um, 22 of February 2020 when uh, COVID started and uh, Italy and uh, Milan was one of the first uh, Western countries to be affected by the COVID. And uh, in just uh, two weeks, uh, we moved uh, from a uh, small, uh, small city affected to the entire region. Uh, in the map, you can see the boundaries of our region, that is uh, Lombardy. And uh, with, uh, in, the, in, in this position, you can see Milan and so, uh, at the early stage, uh, we weren't the first uh, place in which uh, COVID was spreaded, but um, uh, in just a few days, in two days, finally, uh, these two lockdown, lo local lockdown was uh, established in uh, closer to Milan. And so in that days, uh, the mayor decided to close immediately all the schools. And uh, we were uh, engaged in uh, all the action that regarding uh, the redistribution of the food losses that were in our cooking center, which was stocked in our cooking center. And we start sharing in a few days uh, about uh, uh, four, uh, four tons of uh, the food, but not all of our stocks, because in our idea there was at that time, but in just a few days, uh, we were come back to reopen the schools. Um, but then, uh, as you can imagine, as, as all, we, all, all of us remember, um, the, the COVID spread very, very fast. Um, and so in just uh, one week and then also in the second week, uh, our national government decided that uh, our region was need to be entering a lockdown. And so uh, the mayor established uh, the municipal emergency headquarters in which that is, uh, in general, generally speaking, managed by our civic defense department. That is a unit, uh, a department of our municipality fully uh, organized uh, in order to deliver um, civil defense actions. Uh, but this time also the, civil, the social affairs department uh, was uh, involved in uh, the headquarter and the director of the social affairs department asking also to our food policy office to be engaged. And we start immediately to establish uh, fast contact with uh, all the private sectors, so retailers uh, and all the charities that was uh, uh, our main partner uh, based on the action that was delivered in the previous year. Milan, we have uh, more than 200 of food retailers uh, divided in uh, nine uh, big companies. And so we start immediately connecting with all of them uh, to, to, to establish a contact line uh, to say, okay, if there are some issues we can uh, share, you can share with us. We are here, we want to work together. And one of the action that was immediately clear was uh, the topic about the line. And so with our image that in all of our cities happened in that period. So the people that was uh, uh, waiting uh, hour 
outside the line. And, in that, uh, and working with a startup, we decided that, um, uh, so a startup was, uh, was launched also with our support uh, in order to map all the time, uh, waiting time for each retailer. And, uh, and so based on this action, uh, we, we noticed that uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, high number for, for one retailer can be spread to the, to the closer and so on. And, uh, in, and it works very well. But then we see that uh, all of this part uh, at the end works. And so we moved immediately and was a two parallel uh, um, action of stream of work to, to, to contact uh, all the big uh, charities that was in, in charge of uh, managing food day distribution. And we discovered that the 80% of all of these uh, actors uh, were decided to... Sorry. Thanks. Can you mute yourself? Thank you. Um, uh, we discovered that the 80% was uh, in the phase of closing or suspended the election. And so this is the situation in which we move. And uh, within the, 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 the emergency headquarters, we decided to start immediately new action. And in this, in this uh, slide, you can see all the action that we start delivering in that period on uh, primarily distribution of food aid, but then becoming also distribution of food vouchers and also new action about uh, food losses redistribution. Uh, here you can see all the action that are new action delivered in the last two years. So since uh, the, 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 the emerging of the COVID. Um, but uh, starting in, uh, like in the timeline, we start immediately to, to take in our uh, in charge of a food aid distribution Directly, we convert 10 spaces to becoming temporary hub, hubs in which food was stocked and in which we can engage the municipal employees to prepare uh, the food boxes and then also to distribute directly at home by converting pre-existing tenders with uh, vans and so on. And that was the first time in which uh, we centralized this, this, uh, this system and in which the municipality was directly engaged in this system. For each other, we were, were activated a social worker that uh, was in charge to, to, to establish the list of the family needs and also to collect the data and information and, and point of contact with all the charities that were suspended by election. We delivered this action for four months, uh, from the 8th of March until the 30th of June of last year, and uh, was distributed about uh, 600 of food uh, tons, uh, uh, per uh, uh, 20,000 of people based on this system. Then was the summer and in the, and in the same period, we also launched with the social affairs department uh, food vouchers. That was, uh, here you can see some data that was also prepared by a national, by a fund that was allocated for, for, from our national government. And, uh, and for, in our opinion, works very well. The combination among food hub and food vouchers uh, was uh, a good, a proper answer to the issue of food poverty in that period. As also measure of temporary emergency, because after, during the summer, the charities reopened their, their effort, their, their uh, places. And uh, we discovered that there are a grew number uh, of uh, people in needs. And so in uh, December, we start launching an extra food aid supply in which, again, we centralize uh, uh, exploiting uh, uh, a funding from the USAID. We centralize uh, um, the logistics of this, of this system because with all the money, we buy pre-packaged um, pre standard boxes and uh, we stock in this... Uh, in these uh, dots, uh, red dots outside the city, that was one of our logistic uh, center. And then we distributed directly to all the charities that, uh, that were selected due to the increment of the people in needs. Uh, we do this system last, uh, last December, so in the Christmas time, and we want to do also this year in 2021 with uh, new, new funds. Uh, and then after this, uh, again, another temporary measure, we reopen the food aid distribution center, not uh, this time, not uh, directly with our municipal employees, by, but uh, uh, launch a public calls 
to engage uh, uh, third sector and, and uh, uh, civil society organization, organization uh, that was that want to re reinforce this system. So we are we are located uh, uh, a grant for each of these um, organization, and also we established for the first time a joint database between the municipality to all of the six uh, of the six um, um, systemic NGOs. And uh, in our opinion, works very well. And for this reason, uh, also for the 2022, we want to uh, reopen the this, this kind of relaunch this time of uh, measure. Uh, in the same period, uh, after the lockdown, uh, we reactivated all of our food waste hub in which uh, we collected uh, food losses and we distributed them uh, for uh, other associations, so a B2B. And um, we now have three uh, local food waste hub ongoing, two that are in phase of uh, preparation, one in our wholesale market, and one of them is also in charge to connect uh, and to transform food in order to um, enlarge the shelf life uh, of uh, these losses. And this is all the action, uh, a very glimpse on all, a very overview of all of our action deliver. And here you can see all of them connected. And our question is uh, how we can stabilize all of these uh, temporary measures? Because, uh, yeah, we do in 2020, we do again in 2021, and we have funds for do also in the 2022. But the main question is how we can stabilize this, this system in order to become one of the new field of action of our uh, food policy and social affairs policies. And uh, the idea was to un have a deep, understand, a deep understanding of all of these kind of uh, uh, measures. And there's also uh, uh, some glimpse, uh, some, uh, some uh, suggestion on the replication. And uh, we try to, to have a deep understanding of the different food aid operational models. So from soup kitchen, um, I mean, uh, social canteens, uh, as well all the food aid distribution of a pack, uh, the social uh, market, and also the food voucher. Uh, we design this kind of fluxes in order to have a clear idea on where the target, who, uh, where they are taking their food, and so on. Then we do a huge map, very detailed per each of our neighborhoods, in order to understand where are based all of these logistic centers, small hub spaces, association, charities, civil society organization, and so on. For everything, so for food aid, for food losses and distribution, for social canteen, as well for social markets. And Andrea, do... maybe just one more minute. Sorry to interrupt, yes. just so we can finish. I will time. end the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do the same also at the metropolitan level, because from one side we are in charge for the municipality of Milan, and on the other end we are also, our mayor is also metropolitan mayor. And so with the same approach, with the same uh, approach, uh, with the same method, we, we, we also map all of these uh, uh, organizations outside Milan in order to establish also relation with them. And uh, finally, uh, the, 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 the big... Uh, the big uh, lesson there is that we need to co-create uh, in all the time with all of our stakeholders, shareholders, actors in our cities internally. So we did the different municipal department and also external with all of our partners. And to the end, uh, we prepare, um, we are drafting together a joint action plan in which we are defining an internal commitment of a different structures. Uh, that are also political side, technical side, office team, as well municipal agencies, and also with all the external partners in order to go together uh, to tackling the food poverty in a strategic point of view and to have a clear uh, legacy of what we have done uh, in, during the, the, pan the pandemic period. Thank you for this Thank opportunity you. and I stay here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Uh Really appreciate it. Kelsey, if you could just move to your feedback slide um, and share that. We just have a couple of minutes here. We're just going to ask everyone to, yes, and, and Florence put in chat the learning platform where we'll have all of that. Um, so Kelsey, maybe if you could just move to the feedback slide, the next slide there. Whoops. 
Sorry, Kelsey, was that you? So we're just trying to get to the, the feedback slide. So if any of you have feedback, please enter it in chat, feedback on the content, anything like that, please do that. Um, so Kel, perfect. And you can also email Florence. Florence, I don't know why I gave you an extra accent there. Um, anything on the content, the mix of subject matter, experts, too long, too short, et cetera, please help share this with your network, all of that. Thank you, Florence, for your email there. Excellent. And we'll just move to the last slide here, Kelsey. Thanks. I know it's a little bit slow. Kelsey, if we can just move to the last slide where it has the update on the, um, the next webinar. So we just, again, sorry, we're having trouble uh, changing Minor slides. technical difficulty, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So the final slide here, we just want to alert everyone to the next webinar, series, next webinar in this series. It's on emergency food plans for refugees migrants and communities in crisis. So we have some excellent speakers already lined up. We're gonna hear from the World Food Program to frame that up as well as speakers from uh, Turkey and Madagascar. So really, I could see it going to 1.5 hours, which is, um, thank you for that comment. We'll just keep that chat in. So Kelsey, I don't know if you can move to the final slide here. I know we're having some difficulties. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks everyone. And we really appreciate your time. We wanted to make sure we end on time. If anyone else has chat, please just keep logging it in and we'll go through all that feedback. Any last comments from everyone? Anyone, any final? All right, thanks Amazing. everyone. Amazing, we need next more webinar. time. Amazing. We need more time, we do. Everyone's busy schedule in between COP26, MUFPP, and everyone's just busy daily lives. As you heard, it's hard to get everyone even for an hour. But thank you, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very right. much, Kim. Goodbye. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, Kim. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye.